Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the John Campia Show here on my YouTube channel. I'm, of course, your host, John Campia, and I'm humbled and honored that you would decide to spend a part of your day here with me and the rest of your fellow movie fans talking about some of our favorite things in the world, movies and television and crap like that. Uh, as you can tell, I'm not in my regular studio. I decided to drive back down to Vegas because geographically, it's very close to where I live. And I've been volunteering for a couple of days down here after all the events. Now, I know a lot of you guys would do the same thing, but geographically, you're not as close as me, but there are still many ways you can help the situation in Vegas. Look online. There's still an active GoFundMe page. There's lots of things you guys can do to help out the situation in Vegas. So go check that out and see what you can do. Because I know a lot of you guys have been asking me, what can we do if we want to help out Vegas? Lots of ways. Just search online and you'll find a whole bunch of stuff that you can do. Okay, so... Can't do the show live because I'm not in an area where I have as reliable internet to do, you know, HD live streaming stuff, but I'm still going to take a whole bunch of questions today that you guys have sent in to me. How do you get a topic or question on the John Campia show? It's easy. Just email me at john at the john campia show.com. Once again, that's john at the john campia show.com. And this is vital guys. Put the word topic in the subject line. Make sure you put that word topic in the subject line or else I'm not going to see the email. Also, make sure you keep your email to 90 words or less. If it's any longer than that, I can't read it. And even if I wanted to read it, I wouldn't physically be able to fit it on the screen. So make sure you keep the email short. Okay. So with all that out of the way, I've picked what I think are five pretty interesting questions here today. One of them I'm sure is going to get a lot of controversial discussion going on, but that's what we love to do as film fans. We love to discuss and debate. But let's move on now with the first question of the day. And the first question today comes to us from Austin Knight, who writes, Hey, John, I've been following you since the old AMC days. Well, thank you very much. Uh, when you was on there, <laughs> when you was on there with Amy Rose, my question is, why aren't movies that release towards the beginning of the year cannot be Oscar nominated? Why don't the Oscars consider movies throughout the entire year? Well, thanks a lot for the question, man. And, you know, we're getting into what everybody talks about as Oscar season, the time of year when most studios, when they have a film that they think is might be Oscar worthy or be up for contention for an Oscar, they put them out this time of year, maybe a little bit later from now, but we're getting into that time year known as Oscar season. So quite regularly, when the Oscars come around in February, we see that a lot of these movies that have just recently been released are the ones getting nominated. So Austin is asking a question that I have been asked many times over the years. Why don't the Oscars count movies at the beginning of the year? Why do they have to release near the end of the year? The answer to that question is they do consider movies from all 12 months out of the year. They do. There have been a number of examples every single year of movies that get released earlier in the year that are still up for Oscar contention, stuff like that. The issue is not that the Oscars only count movies released towards the end of the year. The issue is actually an issue of marketing and business and money from the studios, not from the Oscars themselves. Here's how it basically shakes down. If you're a studio executive, let's say you're a studio executive over at Paramount, and every day after your daily crisis meeting about how the hell do we save Transformers, you also have a meeting about this new movie you guys have. And you guys love this new movie you have. You think the script is one of the best scripts you've read in years. You've got a killer director attached. Let's, I don't know, let's say you've got uh, Martin Scorsese is attached to direct it. You've got a great cast. You feel really good about this film. Like you just think it's aces. And you guys and your staff believe it could win an Oscar. So then what do you do? What you do is you put that movie out as close to the Oscars as possible so that when Oscar buzz starts to generate, it can directly affect your box office. The reason, the main reason, there are several other reasons as well, but the main reason that studios will put out their films that they think might have a shot at Oscars towards the end of the year is because if we put it as close to the end of the year as possible, then Oscar buzz will help promote the film and get more people out to see it. You know, you put out an Oscar buzz movie in March, no one's talking about the Oscars. Oscars aren't on anybody's radar yet in like March or April or May. Nobody's talking about the Oscars yet. So your movie's going to do the business it's going to do, and that's great. But you put that movie out late November, late December, or what a lot of films like to do is 
have a limited release in December, you know, where they put out in two or three theaters, just enough to still qualify for the Oscars for that year. You put it in limited release in, say, December, and then have wide release in late January, right? Right close to the Oscars so it can really benefit from that Oscar buzz. Because as long as you put your movie in a movie theater in Los Angeles and one in New York in a calendar year, your movie now qualifies for the Oscars for that year. So what a lot of films will do is like, let's say they've got a, a movie called uh, Eddie the Pillow. Okay, Eddie the Pillow the movie. We believe it's going to win tons of Oscars. Okay, for whatever reason. So they put Eddie the Pillow movie, but they want to, they believe it's going to get so much Oscar buzz, we want to release it close to the Oscars. Ah, so here's what we do. Let's book three or four theaters and put the movie, Eddie the Pillow, in theaters in like the second or third week of December in limited release. Now we qualify for the Oscars. Now, since it's already released, now in January, as we're about five or six weeks away from the Oscars, now let's put it out in wide release so we can also advertise, you know, going to be nominated for this or has been nominated for seven Academy Awards and it adds to your business. Now, there's other smaller practical reasons why the studios would want to put these movies near the end of the year. One is out of sight, out of mind, right? You want it to be out and fresh in the Oscar voters' mind. There are over 7,000 voting members of the Academy. So you want to put it out so it's as fresh in their minds as possible, a little bit of strategy there. But really the main reason is business. You want to capitalize on that buzz. And that's why they put these movies out later to the end of the year. Oscars will still consider your film all throughout the year, but it's not the Oscars doing the considering. It's the studios deciding when to put those movies out so they can capitalize on the buzz. Anyway, thanks a lot for the question, man. I'm sure there are other issues as well. If you know some other issues or have some other theories, jump in the comments section and let me know your thoughts. All right. Let's move on now to the next question. And the next question comes to us from one of my Patreon supporters, Kevin. Now, I'm going to take a small commercial break here and shamelessly plug my Patreon. As you guys know, I left the corporate overlords. I no longer work for any corporations. I wanted to do what I do on my own. And one of the reasons I'm able to do that is because of my Patreon supporters who actually step up and support the content they like. There are lots of advantages to being a Patreon supporter. Do me a favor, check out this link, patreon.com slash John Campy, get all the information about being a Patreon supporter, and maybe you'll consider becoming one of my Patreon supporters. All right, with the shameless plug out of the way, let's get back to Kevin's question. And Kevin's question is this. I've listened to you extol the virtues of Man of Steel many, many times. That's right. I talk about Man of Steel a lot. <laughs> is there anything you don't like about the movie? I'm bothered that the emergence of Superman seems to be the public's first experience with a superhero. To me, this means that the years that Batman spent fighting crime is relegated to myth and urban legend? Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot for the question, Kevin. And yes, for those of you who've watched me for any period of time, you know I am a Man of Steel fanatic. Uh, it's in my top 10 best comic book movies of all time. I think it is the most tragically underrated comic book movie of all time. I think the movie is a masterpiece of the genre. Anyway. With that being said, is there anything I don't like about the film? I, I mean, I don't know. It's pretty solid all the way through. I, I mean, I think maybe it would have been cool if they could have spent, because it's not a super long movie. <laughs> super long? Anyway, it's not a super long movie. I think they probably could have spent another five, ten minutes, not on Krypton in the beginning of the movie, but just addressing and giving more insight throughout the film on the history of Krypton, a little bit more on the mythology of Krypton. I know we got a new Krypton TV show coming, but I think that could probably could have been good. But generally speaking, I'm extremely happy with the movie. Now, onto the main issue that you're bringing up is that, of course, Man of Steel is the first movie of the new DCEU or whatever it is they're calling it now. So there's no reference to any other heroes. This is the first superhero we've ever seen. Well, what, what about Batman? You know, Batman's been going around. Is Doesn't that kind of contradict the notion that Batman's been around for a long time? I don't think so. Because remember, nobody thinks Batman, other than maybe some whispers around the criminal underworld, nobody thinks Batman is a demigod. It seems to me that most people know in this DCEU, they know, the people who live in it know that Batman is a dude. He's a guy. He's a nasty guy. But he's a guy who just has taken upon himself to go and beat the living hell uh, out of criminals. He's not a god from outer space who flies and shoots laser beams from his freaking eyes. That's a different thing altogether. 
I mean, that's a totally different thing. It's one thing to have a dude who walks around the streets with a baseball bat and, you know, clunks uh, purse snatchers over the head. That's one thing, but that's not, to a lot of people's understanding, that's not a superhero. Like if you lived in that world, there's a vigilante out there doing this stuff. Superman to the people who are living in that universe, the, the average Joe and Mary who are living in the DCEU universe, Superman was the first thing they've ever seen to an alien, number one, who flies, can rip the moon apart with his hands if he wants to, shoots laser out of his eyes and do all those sorts of wonderful things. It's a totally different thing. Now, as people who live outside of the DCEU, as comic book readers, yes, we count Batman as a superhero. But to people living in the DCU, I don't know that that would have been the case. There's a vigilante who lives in Gotham who does some nasty stuff to you if you are a criminal. But th I think that's a totally different thing. And I love the way that in Batman versus Superman, the way the movie opens, I, I can't remember the exact text, it was like two years ago, the day um, the world was introduced to the Superman. I mean, I love that kind of superimposed title that they came up where you, before you see Bruce Wayne driving through the city, trying to get to his Wayne foundation building. But I love that because that really does signify the answer to your question. It's like, that was the day the world changed. An alien, the Superman has revealed himself to the world. That changed the world. A vigilante in Gotham beating the crap out of some guys. It doesn't change the world from people's points of view. So that's how I see that in any way. What do you guys think? How do you attribute the lack of any mention of Batman in Man of Steel? Jump to the comments section. And let me know your thoughts. All right, let's move on to the next question now. And the next question today comes to us from Dylan Scranton, who writes, Hey, my name is Dylan. I'm a huge fan from Delta, Ohio. Go Ohio. I'm curious to know your thoughts. Oh boy, here we go on the Jeepers Creepers 3 controversy. To me, it's a matter of separating the artist from the art. Why let one person ruin uh, the image of the film for the studio and the rest of the film crew who worked so hard on it due to one person's mistake? All right. For those of you who do not know what uh, Dylan is talking about, Jeepers Creepers is directed by a guy uh, named Victor Salva. Now, the reason there's a whole bunch of controversy around it, for those of you who haven't heard about this, Victor Salva is a convicted pedophile. In 1988, uh, he did a movie called Clown House. I, th I think it was called Clown House, anyway. And he had a 12-year-old boy in that movie. Turns out, um, he did inappropriate things with the 12-year-old boy. The 12-year-old boy and his family reported it. The police raided Victor Salva's house, and they actually found that Victor had filmed himself with uh, giving oral sex. I don't know if it was giving or receiving. It's irrelevant. Um, with the, the boy. He was convicted, uh, was sentenced to three years, did about, oh, about a year and a half, I think, in prison. While he was in prison... Uh, it got reported that he had was, as will happen to pedophiles in prison, uh, he got severely beaten to within an inch of his life on a couple of occasions. They thought he was going to die a couple of times. Anyway. So anyway, he serves a sentence, had four more years of probation. I believe it was four years of probation where he had to do a number of things. And apparently while in prison, he continued to work. Like he wrote, uh, you know, he wrote scripts and one of the scripts was Powder. I believe that's the movie John Travolta that a studio picked up later on and made a movie out of. And actually, he came back and directed. So anyway, the controversy surrounding Jeepers Creepers is that, you know, a lot of people are asking, should this guy be allowed to direct movies anymore? I mean, in 1988, he sexually assaulted a kid. He had oral sex with a kid. I mean, a 12-year-old child, for heaven's sakes. Should he be allowed to now to continue to work? Should he be allowed to continue to direct movies? I'm going to tell you right now, I don't have the answer and I struggle with this. I really do. I'm, I'm just, I mean, I, I want to be able to say F that guy, burn him. Like, I, trust me, that's what's inside me. I, I want to you know, like just yell and scream that out. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of you guys do too. I'm sure we all collectively feel a lot of very righteous indignation about, about a guy who would do that. Okay. However, I do, I'm going to admit, and I know this is not going to be popular to say, but I will admit to you, I struggle with it though. And, and here's where I struggle. 
what is our position as a society, let alone as film fans? And we'll get to the film fan specific part of this in a second, but what do we as a society, what is our outlook towards people who break our society laws? Do we then believe in second chances? Now, who we believe in them for, just put that aside for a second. Do we as a society believe in second chances? Do we believe in the principle of paying your debt to society, accepting whatever punishment is doled out by our court system, and then letting them try to become productive members of our society again and try to resume their lives? Do we believe in that? that and, I'm, and again, I'm not, I'm not saying one side of the other. I'm, I'm letting you know I'm struggling with this, right? I'm just presenting both sides of my head here. Um, this is not like a situation with Roman Polanski. And everybody, maybe you've seen the video I did on Roman Polanski, where this dude never paid for his crime. You know, he upped and ran away, you know, kind of like um, uh, Monty Python, Holy Grail, bravely ran away. I mean, he he hopped on a plane and ran away so he didn't have to face his punishment for what he did. That's a different situation. Here we're talking about a guy, a guy who... I mean, what kind of human being does what he did? But he was caught. He was sentenced. He went to prison. He did his time. He did all the things the court required him to do afterwards. Do we as a society, and again, I don't have an answer to this. I'm processing this. I'm just processing. I, I don't have an answer. Do we as a society say, okay, now you, you've served your time, you did the things you're supposed to do, you went to prison, you did all the, the required things that the court made you do, do we as a society then say, okay, you now have another chance, proceed with your life, don't screw up again and try to do things to make up for what you did? <clears throat> or do we say, like a lot of us, and there's a very large part of me that feels this, no, F that guy, screw him for what he did, screw him for what he did. And honestly, I don't, I don't know. Like what, let's, let's move from like what he did to like another situation that can really scar and damage people, a home invasion. Like, do we take like a 24 year old guy who 15 years ago did a home invasion, held a family at gunpoint while he robbed them? You know, maybe they had a 15 year old daughter or seven year old daughter who's now like really disturbed for the rest of her life because of what happened. Okay. They catch the guy. He gets sentenced to a year, two years, three years in prison. He goes through a lot of stuff, blah, blah, blah. And now he's trying to reform himself. Do we say, all right, you have a chance to do that? Or do we say, no, once you break one of our rules, you're dead to us. And honestly, I, I can't say one way or the other because I feel very torn by it. And then what do we do? Do we, do we take a very questionable position would say, well, no, no, you can come out of prison and you can proceed with your life, but you can't direct movies. Well, well, why is that different from, let's say the guy was a plumber. Do we say you shouldn't be allowed to be a plumber anymore? Well, that's how I earn my living. That's what I do. I, I am a plumber. If I'm going to resume my life and you say, if I pay my debt to society and I do the things I was supposed to do and I did everything the court said, Am I not allowed to resume my life? And I'm a, I'm a plumber. Should I not be allowed to profit and earn a living from being a plumber? So a film director comes out. That's what he is. He's a movie director. He writes and directs movies. Should he not be allowed to continue with his life? And again, I don't know. Because I think there's a very visceral part of us, me especially, that thinks, I just want to throw this guy under a rock. Fine, fine, fine. Okay, he served his time in jail. But now I just want to throw that guy under a rock. I never want to see him. I never want to hear his name. I just want him shunned. I want him exiled to some island below. There's a part of me that really feels that way. And I'm sure a lot of you feel that way too. But then I struggle with, well, do I or do I not believe in the idea of rehabilitation? Do I or do I not believe in second chances? Do I or do I not believe that once a person is caught, convicted, punished, and all that kind of stuff, and does everything you're supposed to do, do I not then believe in second chances? And I, I, I don't know. I struggle with it. Folks, so now, as movie fans then, what do we say? You know, I've read some articles saying, don't go see Jeepers Creepers 3. I just have no desire to see Jeepers Creepers 3 because I thought Jeepers Creepers 2 sucked. I love the first Jeepers Creepers. Love that movie, which he also directed, by the way. But I have no desire to see Jeepers Creepers 3, but it has nothing to do with Victor Silva. But do we say, as some people are writing articles, and I'm reading in some prominent trades saying, you know what? Don't go see Jeepers Creepers 3. You're just lining the pockets of a pedophile. Well, 
First of all, that's not how the finances in movies work. But anyway, secondly, couldn't we say, let's go back to the plumber example. Couldn't we say the same thing about a, a guy who committed a home invasion and mentally scarred a family for life and now trying went to jail, now is out trying to resume his career as a pocket? Do we say, don't use that plumbing company because you're just lining the pockets of a pedophile? Well, I get it. I get it. <laughs> Believe me, I get it. So what do we do? What's our option here? Do we say anybody who commits a crime like that, that, that victimizes people, do we throw them under a rock? Even after they do their time, do we throw them under a rock and wipe them from existence? Or do we as a society say, no, we believe in second chances and we believe in rehabilitation. And again, I'm just trying to play devil's advocate because honestly, I don't know where I fall on that. I go back and forth on that. And you're right, man. There is a situation of, do we separate the art from the artist? Do we just go watch the movie? Because he was but one guy who worked on it. I'm sure there are about 300 people who worked on that movie. I don't have an answer. I don't know. I don't, I'm not even sure thoughtfully how I feel about it. So I'm sure you guys have a lot of very passionate opinions about it. Leave me your thoughts uh, in the comment section below and let me know what you guys think. It's a great topic that I think is worth all of us as film fans discussing. All right. I spent a lot of time on that topic. Sorry about that. Let me move on now to the next topic. And the next topic, hopefully a little bit more lighthearted than talking about a child abuser. Uh, Rob Irwin writes, Hi, John. Huge fan since the movie Blog Days. Thank you so much. Having seen Logan countless times, I think that is the best movie of the year so far and believe that Jackman and Stewart deserve Oscar consideration for their amazing performances. My question is, what do you think the chances are of Daphne Keene getting nominated for Best Supporting Actress? Keep up the great work from Rob Irwin in Ireland. All right, Rob, like, yes, I agree. Uh, to me, Wind River came close, but to me right now, Logan is still the best movie of the year. And were the Oscars to happen tomorrow, I do believe Jackman should get considered for a nomination. I do believe Patrick Stewart should absolutely be considered for a nomination. What about Daphne Keene, who of course plays, you know, X-23? What about her? She is remarkable in that movie. Like one of the best child performances I have ever seen in my life. Just incredible. What are the chances she might nab a best supporting actress thing? You know what? Better than you think. Because if you go back over the history of the Oscars, the Academy seems to once in a while really like the idea of taking a child actor and giving them a nomination. Go back through Oscar history. It has happened a number of times. And I think now it has to be a truly exceptional uh, example, a truly exceptional performance. But I believe the Daphne Keene example fits. I mean, she just totally sells you on this character. Completely. So because of that, and because of the history of the Academy, liking to do that every once in a while, taking a child actor and giving them a nomination, I don't think the chances are as slim as you might initially think. I actually think there's a chance. I'll do this right now. I will give a solid, very realistic 17% chance. Now, obviously that's on the lower end, but that's a legit chance. 17% chance. That's like rolling a dice and saying, see if it comes up number three. There's a chance it could come up number three. I think there's a 17% chance that Daphne Keene could get nominated. Not just because I love Logan, not just because I thought she was great, but because again, look at the history of the Oscars. This has happened on a couple of occasions and they like doing things like that. So let's just wait and see. I believe there's a shot. All right, now moving on to the final question today. And the final question today comes to us from Ayan Amjad, who writes, Hi, John, big fan. Thank you so much, Ayan. Why do movies with such controversial moments like Iron Man 3 or Mother even get past test screenings? If the studio knows that there are parts that fans or audiences won't like, why not change up the script so people want second viewings? Thanks. So thanks a lot for the question, man. Yeah, obviously, Mother has been a big topic of conversation. I cannot remember the last time a wide release film got an F cinema score rating. Cinema score is based on people, verified people, who actually came, were coming out of the screens of the movie and they were surveyed and it got an F cinema score. That hardly ever happens. That's very rare. And it got an F. I did not like the film beautiful artistic attempt. It's a great piece of art. Not a very good movie though. That's that's my opinion of, of Mother. An incredible piece of art by a great artist in Darren Aronofsky, but not a very good movie. I, I mean, it's just not. It's not an enjoyable film to sit down and watch. 
um, and miserable, sad, tragic movies can still be very enjoyable to watch. Uh, but I mean, I did not get anything out of watching Mother. Interesting, though, that you bring up Iron Man 3. If you're talking about the whole Mandarin thing, don't have a misconception about Iron Man 3. People really like Iron Man 3. It's got a 78% audience rating on Rotten Tomato, but more important, the cinema score, A. Iron Man 3 got an A cinema score. Again, that's not critics. That's not anonymous people online registering votes, even if they've seen the movie or not. This is verified surveys taken of people coming out of the movies around the country, an A cinema score. So Iron Man 3, I know there are a lot of hardcore comic book fans that are very upset, understandably so, about the whole Mandarin bait and switch. I, I get it. But average movie fans didn't mind it. It got an A cinema score, very high Rotten Tomatoes audience score, and a very good Rotten Tomatoes score. So let's not count Iron Man 3 amongst those. I didn't love Iron Man 3, by the way. I'm not trying to defend Iron Man 3, but let's not pretend it's like Mother where everybody hated it. Nope. Vast majority of people actually really liked Iron Man 3, and the, the, the stats show that. But let's talk about Mother. If the studio knew it wasn't going to be received well, why not change it? Well, remember, we say this sometimes. A lot of times, what happens on the page, you envision what that's going to look like in the movie. But until the movie's actually shot and you're sitting in an editing room, this is why Kevin Feige and DC all plan and budget for reshoots later on because they know that once they, no matter how good it looks on paper, when you watch it in an editing room and you're seeing it pieced together, that's the only time you actually really start to get a sense if it's working out or not. And so that's why they plan reshoots. But most movies, 90% of the movies that get made do not have the budgets or the time to do reshoots or plan for reshoots. You just do the best job you can, make the best movie you can, and then you put it out. And by that time, you've already spent all the money on making the damn movie, so you got to put it in theaters to recoup some of that money. So how does it get past test screenings? Well, look, I think with Paramount, what they decided to do, honestly, is something a studio should do every once in a while, which was, I think they knew Mother was not going to be a blockbuster hit, I think they knew Mother was going to be divisive amongst fans. I can tell you that because the PR people from Paramount were talking to me even before I saw the movie and trying to prepare me for the movie. Say, okay, now understand that when you see Mother, it's very much an artistic. So I think they knew that a lot of the audience wasn't going to like it. But they moved ahead and did it because I think every once in a while, a studio should put out a little movie that is just for the sake of art. And as much as I did not like Mother... I'll say it's definitely art. I mean, there's no doubt about it. It's, it's an artistic piece of metaphor done by a wonderful artist in, in Darren Aronofsky. And it is art. And I think it's there's value in a st big Hollywood studio once in a while getting to their roots a little bit and putting out a, small, a couple of small films that are just for the sake of the art. And for that, you know what? I applaud Paramount for doing it. I, I didn't like Mother, but I applaud them for making it. And for putting it out and releasing it. And they really did put out an artistic vision. And, you know, for everybody who always says, studio should never interfere with a director. Well, you get mother. When a studio does not interfere with a director, you get an F Cinema Score movie. That's what you get. You need checks and balances here and there. But anyway, that's just my thoughts on that. Anyway, guys, that will do it for me and this episode of The John Campion Show. Thank you so much for joining me. Listen, don't forget, since you're here, take a second, click on that subscribe button, become a subscriber to my YouTube channel. Make sure you're following me on social media, on Facebook and on Twitter, simply at John Campia. If you like this video and the videos I make, do me a favor, click the thumbs up button, give it a like, leave a comment, join the conversation. Remember, we're all movie fans here together. We love to discuss and debate. Let's debate, even passionately, without resorting to like the 12-year-old nonsense of name-calling stuff like that because we're all just movie fans we're all movie fans anyway guys that'll do it for me thank you so much for joining me and until next time bye bye